Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out on another cold day. Um, I want to finish up what we talked, started talking about last time about provisional patent applications and then kind of take you through um, uh, non-provisional patent applications uh, so that you have an appreciation of uh, uh, all you need to know essentially when it comes to filing a patent application. Um, I um, brought in uh, some uh, things to show you when it came to, when it comes to provisional and and even non-provisional patent applications, so that maybe you get an idea of um, of uh, really what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's easier to explain what I mean by showing you an example. I don't know about you, but the way I learn is I look at what somebody else has done and you know I, I, I copy them and I try to uh, try to learn that way and sometimes with this this kind of technical stuff it's easier to look at what other people have done and, and apply it to your own circumstances I think that anyhow that's that's um, that's the way I learn um, and um, uh, it gives you an idea also what sort of level of detail uh, goes into a successful provisional and non-provisional patent application so we talked about uh, claims and we talked about abstracts, we talked about figures and drawings and the description that you need in a provisional patent application. Uh, by the way, on the materials that I posted for yesterday, there is actually a sample uh, provisional patent application uh, for, a, I think it's a scotch tape uh, dispenser. Um, of course, that's not what it's called. It's called something else. Uh, there's, a, there's a generic term for it. But it has an abstract. It has a claim section. It has a description. It has figures. Um, and so it's kind of a, a good uh, uh, example of what I'm talking about when it comes to a, um, uh, a provisional patent application. But I, I thought I'd bring in, start off today with a few, you know, uh, examples of other provisional patent applications. Uh, this is for a, uh, a mechanical or utility patent uh, for um, uh, spiky football massa uh, uh, foot massages. Uh, <laughs> professor, I don't know if any of, have you, have any of you taken a course with Alex Slocum? Yeah, you know, Alex is, if you haven't taken a course with Alex Slocum, take a course with Alex Slocum. You, you need to exp have the need to um, do the uh, Professor Slocum experience. Um, he's really, um, uh, you know, if I, had, if I had a teacher like him when I was uh, your age, I would have mounted to something. I really, I really think Alex's classes are fantastic. And he's one of the most prolific inventors uh, here at the, uh, uh, at the university. And this is one of his, um, one of his ideas. If, I don't know, if you ever go to Alex's house, if you go into the basement, it looks like a mad scientist laboratory. I mean, you know, if, um, uh, if it ever came to it, I'm sure Alex could literally live uh, off, of, uh, off of the grid entirely and make his own, um, uh, make his own things. So it's, it's, you know, he's, he's one of these really unique individuals and one of the most uh, brilliant and, um, uh, minds here and also, in, in my mind, uh, just about the best teacher I've ever seen. So... Anyhow, this is one of his uh, uh, drawings uh, that uh, were used with his permission for spiky um, balls foot massager. All right, he may be a brilliant uh, engineer, maybe not so much when it comes to naming these things, all right? Uh, everybody has to be good at something. Um, so anyhow, these are some of the figures from, um, from that preliminary or provisional patent application. See, it even gives a cross-section of the device. As you can see, just going back and forth with these figures, you can really see how um, it explains, you remember the old saying, a picture is worth 10,000 words, but it explains to the patent examiner exactly what it is that you're uh, attempting to patent here and the unique features of it. You know, this, ha this device happens to be hollow. They're little rubber balls. They have little spikes on them. They're connected by a, um, uh, uh, by a, uh, a rope, uh, which happens to be stretchy. 
But, you know, if a patent examiner is trying to determine what it is that you're trying to patent, these figures are just, um, are just great. Um, here's the um, abstract from the actual application. Um, this is literally um, what was filed with the, um, successfully filed, by the way, with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Those, those numbers that you see on the uh, side of the page are simply uh, the lines from the uh, application. It starts on line one and it goes through. So later on when you're actually having a dialogue with the patent examiner, you can actually refer to the page and the line that you might, might be um, uh, talking about. It, when you file a provisional patent application and especially when you provide, uh, file a non-provisional application with the patent office, what you really are doing is you're entering into a three-year dialogue with a patent examiner who receives your invention and is tasked with deciding whether or not it should be patented. And so uh, oftentimes what you'll do is you'll have telephone conversations after you file the application with the patent examiner about various aspects of the application. And it's easier to be able to to refer uh, to a particular line. That's all that those numbers mean. But you'll oftentimes have discussions with the patent examiner about the claims section in your, um, in your application, about the abstract section, about the figures, about the description. You know, lots of time the examiner will say things like, gee, I think you're really overreaching with these claims. Uh, or have you really included all the claims that you think um, you know, might apply? So there's a, there's a dialogue that goes on once you file the application. And as I've said several times, the people at the United States Patent and Trademark Office are really knowledgeable and do a wonderful job. There's an awful lot of specialized skill and knowledge. It's not their first rodeo. And if you happen to be a first-time inventor, you'll find them to be a tremendous resource and um, really a very friendly uh, uh, resource. So that's just a, that's, that's the abstract. Remember we were talking yesterday it should be more than 50 words, less than 150 words. I mean, it should only be one paragraph. You can see how this absolutely, uh, absolutely complies in every respect with what we talked about yesterday. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about yesterday, well, I, I did talk about, but I didn't show you an example uh, of, is the cover sheet. Remember, these, there are no particular forms or uh, uh, required uh, formatting that you... Uh, or official documents that you file with the U U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, except for one when it comes to provisionals, which is the cover sheet. And this information is really important, um, by the way, because um, these all are uh, used to determine whether or not your invention is patentable. First of all, um, it, um, you have to have the names of the inventors. Um, you have to have, you know, how to contact them, um, a title of the invention, uh, the name and registration number of the attorney or agent uh, uh, who is representing you if you have one, um, a correspondence address, as I said, you know, that's for the dialogue that's going to ensue. And also, any U.S. government uh, agency that has a proprietary interest in your invention, this disclosure is important uh, because, of course, if you've invented something pursuant to a contract uh, that uh, you have with the United States government, um, they may own a piece of the action. And that's important, actually, for everybody here at MIT because an awful lot of the research uh, that's conducted at this uh, institution is conducted either with uh, government or private funding. And so one of the things that needs to be disclosed on every provisional patent application uh, is the other party or parties who may have an interest in this invention. Um, and here's the cover sheet. Um, it's nothing fancy. Um, it, I couldn't fit it all on one page, so it's, it, there it is there. Um, another example, um, and, and I use this example to show you how a design may evolve. This is another provisional patent application that uh, Alex did called Run Fins. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody running in the pool. But uh, one of the ideas that Alex had was that if uh, you could put something on your feet that created resistance, it would, you know, improve the, um, the, uh, the, the, the um, 
usefulness or the effectiveness of the, um, of the uh, exercise. So it's patent pending run fins slip onto a user's foot just like swim fins, but instead of a fin projecting from the toe, uh, they have a downward facing bowl like feature under the ball of the foot. These bowls create uh, a large drag force when the user pushes down with their foot and have variable drag when the foot is raised. See, this is a perfect description, again, a, a very good example of what I'm talking about when you're describing your invention to the USPTO. And there's even a little puffing in here. You know, uh, they get a really strong leg workout. Thus, it'll be great not only for runners uh, seeking uh, to exercise in the pool, uh, but they can also be a fun way of, uh, of jogging uh, in a lake and uh, uh, see the shoreline. I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. Well, because um, this is actually the the description of the event uh, of the of the of, of the product after the provisional patent was uh, granted. Okay, so we're, re what we're doing in this case is we're actually moving from a provisional to a non-provisional uh, patent application. So once you file a provisional application, you have the right to call something patent pending. And in this particular case, uh, Alex had reached that, uh, had reached that stage. But I, I, the reason I show you this is because I want to show you how these, um, these uh, inventions often evolve during the process of filing a provisional up until the time you file a non-provisional. This is, the, this is the, the device that he came up with in his mad scientist laboratory. You can see it's really pretty, it's a pretty crude device. I think what he did, um, is he uh, cut some, uh, some swim fins uh, down and then maybe stole a dog bowl or something and, uh, and, and glued them on there. Um, but that's the, that's the prototype of, uh, of the device that he filed uh, along with the, the, the photo of the prototype with the provisional patent application. And then, of course, being from MIT and having access to uh, a lot of computational um, uh, uh, dynamic formulas here. Uh, of course, what did Alex do is, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, somebody uh, helped him out with this, but you know, uh, they did computation of fluid dynamics, uh, uh, a computation of fluid dyna dynamic profile of the device. And again, you know, this is just a fancy way of showing the United States Patent and Trademark Office uh, what your device does. Um, it's a great example of, um, of uh, describing the device uh, for the Patent and Trademark Office. It, it, it's, it's really quite clever, quite uh, unique, and um, uh, it, it's something that the USPTO loves to receive. Um, there's more examples of it. Uh, this was, you know, um, again, uh, more um, uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, of the device showing how they created more resistance. Uh, remember, novelty is so important, so you want to show how these things are better than anything else that might be uh, as uh, a prior art. Um, and I'm sure there are other devices on the market that Alex was aware of when he did his, his search. Uh, but um, this data um, shows how his are more efficient at doing what they're claimed to, or, or they purport to do. And uh, again, for the patent examiner, creates distance between his invention and the, and the state of the art. Just another way of showing how these are an improvement on prior uh, patents or designs. Um, and then, um, what do you know? Uh, as time went by, uh, we graduated from the cutoff uh, swim fins and doggy bowls to um, this much more sophisticated design. Uh, which is actually the design that, that, that accompanied the patent application. So, you know, we've gone from, from this uh, prototype, which went with the provisional, to this with the, with, that went with the final. So you can see, uh, and, and the reason I, I put this up here, is to illustrate how uh, from the time that you file your provisional until you, the time you file your non-provisional, your designs can evolve and can improve and become more sophisticated. And that's what uh, often happens. You know, uh, you want to plant the flag as early as possible in terms of protecting your invention. 
But at that point, you may not be, it may not be fully developed and, and during the year grace period that you have um, during the provisional phase of your patent uh, uh, application, uh, you can come up with better ideas. And when you find, finally fi uh, file the, uh, uh, the non-provisional patent application, either by uh, converting your, uh, your provisional into a non-provisional or filing a new application that references the provisional, uh, you can have a much more sophisticated and highly developed product. Um, and um, let's see, uh, these, this is another, um, again, you know, you can go on the website and, and pull this stuff up, but um, this is a, um, a provisional patent application with various claims and an abstract and a description uh, for a scotch tape, uh, it's not really a scotch tape dispenser, it's something that dispenses, um, what do you call it, uh, pinstriping, okay? Uh, and um, it's just an example of, of, a, of a provisional patent application that I thought would be useful that you could have a look at and take a look at the abstract, take a look at the description, take a look at the claims, see how they are worded. Um, you know, um, a lot of uh, this is, um, is uh, imitation. You just look at what other people have done and um, and uh, you know, adapt it for yourself. So the duration of a, of a provisional patent. Uh, after a year, what happens? So um, as you know, the provisional patent only lasts for 12 months, and that period of time can't be extended. So at the end of the 12-month period, you have a choice. You either have to convert your provisional patent application into a non-provisional patent application, or you have to file a brand new patent application non-provisional application that references your prior, the prior uh, provisional. Uh, because remember, you want to protect that, that intellectual property from the date of your filing. Um, so the corresponding non-provisional application must contain or be amended to uh, contain a specific reference to the, uh, to the provisional. And, and why is that important? Why is that important? Why is it important to reference back to the, the uh, provisional application? The reason it's important is because you want to go back in time to the earliest date to protect your uh, intellectual property, okay? Um, now, you have a choice, as I said. You can either convert to a non-provisional uh, or you can file a new patent application. There's a, there's a there's a downside uh, to uh, converting to a, uh, a non-provisional from a provisional because you, you, you lose the year. So just so you understand, if you convert to a non-provisional application, um, that year that you've spent gets taken off or gets added to the term of your patent. You see what I mean? So if a patent is 20 years, uh, let's say you're, you, you file a, an application in year one, you file your non-provisional at the end of year one. When the, your patent is, um, is uh, approved, the date of your patent goes back to the original provisional. And, you know, it's important um, to some people to extend that date as much as possible. And so what you do in those cases, rather than filing, converting a, non -provi a provisional to a non-provisional, is you file a whole new patent application uh, and just reference the, uh, the prior non-provisional, okay? So that's, that's one of the important thing and things, things to remember when it comes to converting a non-provisional to a, excuse me, a provisional to a non-provisional. Uh, it's all about time. It, it, there's, it, you know, it's only 20 years, and so some people feel, and, some pe and, and depending upon the invention, it's important to uh, get that extra year. And, and to get the extra year, you file a non-provisional, a brand new non-provisional, and you don't convert the original. If you, if you convert the provisional, you lose the year. Um, so advantages of a provisional patent application, we've talked about it, much cheaper to do, uh, much more streamlined, gives you added time uh, to develop your invention, uh, you know, before you have to commit money and resources to it. You, you have a year to determine whether or not you have a market. 
So all of those things uh, are advantages uh, to a provisional patent application. Um, the other good things that it does is it establishes an official uh, application filing date so that if there's any challenge to your patent later on, you know, you have the certified document that uh, basically ends any of those discussions. Um, and also um, the provisional application uh, gives you um, purchase with the international authorities. Remember we talked yesterday about, novel, about, um, about absolute um, first-to-file countries versus semi-absolute uh, uh, first-to-file countries. The provisional date is what's recognized by other countries. So there's lots of, of advantages to filing a, uh, a provisional. Uh, it also allows you to immediately begin commercial uh, monetization of your, um, of your uh, uh, device. It allows you to market it. It allows you to go to a bank and get money. It allows you to go and get investors. And all the while, your invention is protected. If you try to do all these things before you file the provisional, you may end up uh, with problems protecting your device because of the things we went over about disclosure. So a lot of things can develop while you have the provisional application filed. It's not only you know, the advancements in your design, uh, the, uh, sophist the, the uh, improved sophistication in your claims and in your descriptions, but it also enables you to do the other things that you need to do to bring a device uh, to market, which is to get a banker, get financing, get partners, market the device, publicize the device. A lot of those things will determine whether or not you even want to go forward with a non-provisional application later on. You know, you may want to take that year and go to various trade shows and see if you can drum up any interest in people that have deep pockets that can fund your device. Maybe you don't have the money. Maybe you just have a brilliant idea that you can't get off the ground you, you, because you, know, you, weren't, um, you weren't born a millionaire. Well, there are lots of people who were born millionaires you know, whose job and whose profession is to fund these devices. So you go to trade shows and you try to develop interest. That's, that's the, one of the other advantages of a, of a provisional patent application. Um, uh, again, uh, one of the things you have to do, uh, you know, uh, if you're going to market a device is you've got to manufacture it. So maybe you want to um, meet with um, uh, manufacturer representatives that hold shows here in the United States from, from uh, I know, I think, <laughs> I think Alex had his device uh, eventually um, manufactured by a Korean company. Uh, but, you know, they, they come over here and they're looking to make their, you know, fill their assembly lines with work. And so they'll give you, you know, a certain amount of time in the schedule and they'll enter into a contract with you to produce so many units. You can do all those things because you have a provisional patent approved. Once you have that provisional patent in your hands, it gives you the power uh, to develop that, um, uh, that invention. Um, so that's another advantage of a provisional patent application. Uh, there are other advantages, and I go through them in the, um, in the, uh, on the website. Uh, you know, the advantages to the two-step approach uh, when it comes to manufacturing and developing your device. Uh, you know, one of the big advantages of a, of a, non -provi of, of a provisional patent application is, is saving money. You know, if you, if you don't have to get uh, if you don't have to pay lawyers and you don't have to pay people to do mechanical drawings and you don't have to pay people to uh, uh, develop uh, all the claims for a non-provisional application, that, that, that can be a big advantage to your business plan. So um, if you can get somebody else to do it, and oftentimes, you know, manufacturers will enter into these partnerships. Um, you know, if you, you can enter into a, a partnership with a company in China that wants to produce your, your, your squishy balls or whatever they're called, and if you don't have the money, maybe they'll put up the money. Uh, maybe their attorneys will do the, the, the non-provisional application for you. Um, you know, um, $5,000 in attorney's fees to prepare a non-provisional application, um, you know, uh, that's actually kind of cheap. Uh, but, but the example I give is a, ver a very simple invention, costs 5,000 in attorney's fees to prepare a non-provisional application. 
So the filing fee for a non-provisional application is a, for a small entity is about $500. Therefore, the total cost for a non-provisional application is pretty steep. It, it gets up around 6,000 bucks. But um, if you uh, instead go the provisional patent application route, um, it costs a third of that. And during that year, you either maybe can ask your mom and dad for the additional money you need or line up an investor uh, or uh, determine that there's such a good market out there that it's worthy of the additional ex expense uh, for going the, um, the non-provisional route. Um, so, you know, non-provisional patent applications have all kinds of advantages. Um, so, all right, so you've done your, non -provi your, your provisional patent application, 364 days have gone by, you've determined that your device is really uh, worth uh, protecting, so uh, now uh, you uh, need to file your provisional, uh, your non-provisional patent application. So, um, we talk generally about what goes into a, a provisional patent application uh, and have illustrated what goes into a provisional by basically saying what's, what's not in a, uh, in a provisional. So you don't need claims, you don't need a sophistic, sophisticated set of drawings, uh, a lot of the other things that we talked about. But now you do, uh, now it's time to, um, to file your uh, non-provisional application. Well, the first thing you have to decide is, uh, is it patentable? Uh, is it worthwhile? Uh, am I going to invest five or ten thousand dollars? And and you know, if I am, I want to make sure that I'm not going to get a no from the patent office. So I wanted to start this discussion with a question, which is, uh, can you patent a paper bag? Why? Handles on them. Now, have you have you been like looking at the uh, class materials from yeah. prior years? You know, gee whiz, um, that's exactly right. That that that's exactly right. So, can you patent a paper bag? Well, what's the questions we have to ask? First, is it statutory? And remember the words uh, from the the 1952 uh, Patent Act: uh, any process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter. Is it one of those things? Well. A paper bag is certainly one of those things, right? Is it new? Well, it depends on what you mean by new. Is a paper bag new? I don't think so. But as you point out, that there can, there can be things about a paper bag that are new, are novel, are unique. So maybe, 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 that's, maybe that's patentable. Is it useful? Well, of course, a paper bag is useful, but um, useful is also means, is it operable? Does it work? Um, and is it non-obvious? Non that's, that's, a, that's a tighter, closer question. You know, um, how many ways can you design handles on a, on a paper bag, you know? And, and what handle is unique and what handle is kind of a, an obvious adaptation of prior art? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. And, you know, lastly, does it work? Um, we talked, you know, we talked about the, you know, the CRISPR case. Does it work in the in the in the case of uh, the claims made by the University of California Berkeley? It didn't work. Yes. In this case, uh, shouldn't you patent? If we talk about utility patent, shouldn't you patent the process of producing the bag? Otherwise, uh, doesn't it become a design patent? Or uh, does it mean utility patent the paper bag? It means that no, no one else can produce a paper. Um, well, both are patentable. If you're an expert in manufacturing processes, and let's say you've come up with a process, maybe a machine that can do this in an automated way that's better than prior art, that's possibly patentable. Uh, at the same time, if you've come up with a paper bag, whether it's based upon a, a, uh, a unique process or not, then that also may be patentable. But, but all of these things, I, I guess my point is that these requirements all apply, whether we're talking about patenting a paper bag, a mouse trap, a peanut butter sandwich, 
um, a biological entity, a plant, all of those things uh, apply equally uh, to whatever invention you're trying to protect. Um, and um, the question, of course, um, uh, which has already been answered, um, is a paper bag patentable? The answer is yes. Uh, th this is a, a paper bag, um, which some of you may uh, recognize uh, who've been to an Apple store. Um, the, uh, it has a total of uh, 39 uh, patents. Uh, this actually comes from the patent application. The numbers uh, correspond to figures and unique features of the bag which um, uh, Apple claims make it novel and sufficiently um, uh, new uh, to be patentable. And, and this, is the, um, this is the description from the um, uh, application. Um, the paper bag may include a bag, container, formed of white, solid, bleached, sulfate paper with at least 60% post-consumer content. So, Apple's idea is that our bag is novel and we've put sufficient distance between us and prior art because we've come up with a way to make a paper bag that is composed of 60% recyclable material. Up until this point, according to their application, everybody that's tried this um, uh, had failed. And if you've ever walked home from the, from the supermarket with a paper bag on a rainy day, I think you have an idea what, about what I'm talking about. Um, they, they tend, bags made of recyclable materials tend to fail easily, and Apple came up with a way of making a bag of recyclable materials that didn't fail. Um, and um, what, they, what they did is they, they, they figured out a way to hold the bag together um, with um, uh, different glues and ways of folding and uh, putting the bag together that, um, uh, that it didn't fail. Um, what they basically said is that the alterations that they'd come up with, uh, you know, including unique reinforcements at the folds and the gussets of the bag and at the bottom, uh, made the bag stick together in a way that it didn't fail. So Apple, every time you go to the Apple store now and bring something home, you're carrying uh, a total of 39 separate patentable technologies just, uh, just to bring your, um, your very expensive computer home. Well, because, of course, uh, the idea is to hold the patent and apply it in other, in other areas. So um, the way you, I'll give you an example here. The way, the way the, Handles attached to the sides of the bag um, is um, not only useful for this bag, but you want to hold it. You want to hold that patent uh, for perhaps other applications, other paper bag uh, types. So you're, you, you're not just patenting one. It's a way of expanding the scope of what you own. Okay, uh, you could just apply uh, for this and only this. But then somebody could come along, make a small improvement, all right, and you may have a, a, a problem on your hands protecting that technology. But if you, if you protect the way uh, this is joined or the way these gussets uh, are, um, are uh, put together or how they're glued or where the recyclable material is doubled up, if you patent that, you're, you're, what you're what you're owning is far broader than one simple, uh, you know, a one-off bag. Is so, it, is it 39 because Apple knows and it's powerful? Because it could somebody like me would just do one patent, right? So, well, um, actually, you, you'd probably get into a you'd probably get into a dialogue with the patent examiner, okay? And he'd say probably to you, well, you know, um, because he you would both have studied the prior art. And this, you know, you have to, when you describe your invention, you have to break it down. Okay, what's different about your device? Well, one of the things that's different is the handles. Another thing that's different is the way the material is doubled up at the top. And another way it's different is the way the gussets are folded. So you see, when you break the device down into its constituent parts, that's really what your, that's, that's where the novelty of the invention lies. And so you probably would have had a dialogue with someone that said, gee, you know, you might want, you know, 
So that's um, uh, and that's and that's what the whole pr process is designed to is designed to do. Um, I think I've already covered that. Uh, differences between a provisional and non-provisional. So now we're getting into exactly what uh, you need to do for you need to understand for a uh, a non-provisional. There's a higher filing fee. Of course, we've already talked about more sophisticated and complex drafting. You're going to need, you know, professional mechanical drawings like the Apple bag. Um, a specification application form is required. There's a, there's a real, there's a format that you have to follow. Again, it's on the USPTO website. It's not rocket science, but there is a format that you have to follow. In this case, claims are required, but you, you folks are not going to have any problem with that because you've included claims already in your in your provisional patent application, so you're far, you're far more sophisticated and uh, uh, advanced in the process, so these claims aren't going to scare you. But with a non-provisional, they're required. A declaration is required. Does anybody know what a declaration is? A declaration is one of the most important parts of a non-provisional application, and it's one of the most overlooked. And it's the it's the oath that you take as an inventor that the invention that you are seeking uh, a protection for uh, is of your own making. Or if it is shared with someone, you disclose in, in the declaration the, the identities of all the other contributors to the invention. It's a promise also that you've studied the state of the art or the prior art and that, you've, and that you believe that your invention um, is novel, uh, and it also is a promise that if you encounter any uh, additional facts material to your application, maybe some other inventor comes up with something simultaneously that you become aware of, that you will disclose it to the patent examiner. Um, this, um, this is, uh, like I said, an often overlooked but important part of a non-provisional application. Um, and then, of course, it's, it's very thoroughly examined by the U.S. Uh, PTO uh, 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 examiner. Um, a non-provisional patent application um, should not provide a, a technical uh, description of the invention, uh, but should do, so, should do so in the context of prior, uh, prior art. Uh, the the Runfins example that, um, we, um, that we were looking at earlier. When you file the non-provisional application for that, in your patent application, you need to discuss the prior art. This is different than, you know, the run fins patent number, and you'll give the patent number that was, that was uh, uh, awarded on such and such a date, because, you know, my suction cups at the bottom provide more um, resistance as the computational fluid dynamics uh, uh, illustrations I've provided demonstrate. So you'll always describe your uh, invention in the context of prior art. Um, again, this is for the patent examiner and also to show that you've created distance between yourself and the prior art. Um, the non-provisional patent application requires the development of the application uh, uh, of a strategy for convincing the patent examiner uh, that your uh, invention is worth protecting. And again, you think of it as a dialogue between you and this examiner. Uh, it's a negotiation. Um, you have the knowledge as the inventor. They have the knowledge of what qualifies for protection. And it's, a, it's really a collaboration between the two of you. Um, on the... On the PowerPoint presentation that I'll, uh, I'll post, uh, there's a series of Supreme Court decisions uh, and decisions by the various federal circuits like the Bilski case and the Diamond case and the State Street case. Um, some of them we've even talked about, but, but, which have to do with um, uh, the patentability of, um, of these um, of various um, products but basically reinforces the things that we've talked about. Novelty, usefulness, uh, demonstrated uh, uh, efficacy or operativeness, statutory. Um, but those cases sort of give uh, examples or illustrations of really um, how those um, uh, terms are 
uh, defined in, um, uh, in practical, in, in, in a practical reality. Uh, this is the, um, the um, uh, non-provisional uh, patent application. This is the form that you go on the USPTO website and fill out. Again, nothing scary, nothing scary about it, really quite easy. And you'll find when you look at the PowerPoint presentation, it's exactly what we've been talking about here. Uh, you could go out, I think, with your eyes closed uh, and fill one of these things out yourself uh, uh, now. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on is patent infringement. Anybody know what patent infringement is? I mean, the whole idea of, of patent protection, what is the whole idea of it? What's, what's patent infringement? I know you've heard about it. Somebody other than you. Uh, I'd say it's when you... Boeing, exactly. <laughs> there, there is no one that knows patent infringement better than Boeing. So. Uh, yeah, it's so when you have something that's protected and then someone else that's something, that's something that actually breaks that protection. And by that I meant the victims of patent infringement. Uh, 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 um, exactly right. Um, patent infringement is the commission of a prohibited act with respect to a patented invention without the permission of the, uh, of the patent holder. And how do you get permission to use uh, somebody's device? Um, licensing, exactly. You don't have a license, that means you don't have permission. Um, the other thing that you have to have in order to have infringement is some commercial use. Um, I can put, a, I can put a, uh, uh, a slide up here of uh, anybody's invention I want in the whole world. Why? Because we talked about this. Fair use, right? Um, fair use takes you out of infringement. Whenever um, a lawsuit, whenever I file a lawsuit for a client, uh, alleging patent infringement, or copyright infringement, or trademark infringement, the s first affirmative defense I get back is it's not infringement because it's fair use. Um, second defense I get back, it's not infringement because we weren't making commercial use of your product. In other words, what they're saying to me, yeah, we infringed, but we're allowed to because of the circumstances. Either we weren't trying to make money off it or we were using it as teaching. Uh, you know, uh, there are certain standard defenses you get back in every case, and those are two of them. So, and they're right. If, if it's commercial or if it's, uh, if it's being used for fair use, you know, uh, it's not infringement. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, when in the commercials we, we see Verizon's that says uh, we are better than AT&T, uh -huh. something like that. Is that fair use or? Uh... Well, what are they? What are the? Where, what would you think the infringement would be there, using the AT and T name? Logo, yes. Yeah. Remember, we talked about fair use, about commentary, about reviews, about uh, about being able to criticize. So absolutely, that's fair use. Um, uh, I don't think that they could put the AT and T logo up there, or that would you know that would kind of. That might raise some hackles, but, but certainly you can go on TV and say that you're better than anybody that you, you know, it helps if you are, you know. Uh, but, um, but it's certainly not infringement. It may be lying, uh, but it may not be, it probably isn't infringement. Um, and I'm not sure which is worse. I think, I think lying is probably higher on, on my uh, index of suspicion than, um, than uh, an innocent infringement like that. So it, it, if it's, if it's um, fair use or if it's not commercial, then it's not infringement. But if you're making money off of, uh, you know, somebody found out very recently they did a T-shirt that they were selling around uh, uh, college campuses on a website with um, Albert Einstein's uh, uh, face on it. Um, they got a cease and desist letter just like that. Because there's an institute that owns uh, his likenesses. There was another one in the, in the press really recently. I'm trying to remember. It'll probably pop into my head, but maybe you, some of you can remember. Uh, somebody owns the likeness of a very famous um, uh, scientist, a uh, 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 female scientist. Yesterday was National Woman's Day, and I, you know, I've been 24 hours. I already forgot her name, but um, of course somebody was trying to use uh, her likeness to sell a, uh, a, sell a product. And, and um, again, uh, most famous figures have foundations or institutions that 
own their likenesses. Uh, that has a value, and um, you can't use those without permission. Uh, unless, of course, you're teaching a course at MIT and you want to throw it up on a slide. I can throw up as many pictures of Albert Einstein as I want, so long as I'm not charging admission for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, what I'm using it for. Um, and just to kind of bring these things back together, in order to determine whether or not there's been an infringement, what you do is you look to the claims. You know, we've been spending an awful lot of time talking about claims. Uh, we talked about the claims for a peanut butter sandwich and all the dependent claims. Well, how do you know if there's been an infringement? Well, you look to the claims section. What did the University of California do uh, in the um, CRISPR case? Um, they looked at their claims and they said that there had been infringement because the broad was attempting to patent something that they had claimed previously. Now, it didn't turn out so well for them, but it is an illustration of exactly how you determine uh, where the infringement lies. If it's not claimed, it's not infringement. If it's not in the claim section, if you've thought of a new way and it's not and it's non-obvious, then there's no infringement. So the claim section is terribly important because it tells the public what the device does and what it doesn't do and therefore what is and what is not infringement. Uh, and you need to be able to rely on the claims to, uh, uh, section of a patent uh, as an inventor because anything that's not in the claim section is fair game for you as an inventor. So if you go out and patent something that's you know, a better mousetrap that does one other thing that wasn't claimed, by the way, there, there are over 480 uh, patents for mousetraps. I looked that up last night. There are over 480. You'd be amazed at how many, you can just Google it. You can see how many ways you can make a better mousetrap. Um, another thing to remember about, uh, about infringement is that it's territorial. Okay, so, you know, the limits of a patent uh, are, you know, or the protection that a patent has is limited by the territory in which, which is covered by the patent. So if you only own the United States patent rights for a device, remember we talked about the, um, the, the Book of Mormon. Remember, it was protected in the United States, but then a group of heretics decided they were gonna publish their own in, um, uh, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, and, um, you know, they ran, they had to run down to the, to the secretary's office, uh, which is, literally located near Buckingham Palace and bring those five copies of uh, the Book of Mormon in uh, to get their patent protection in Great Britain. So uh, patent protection is territorial. What, it, what constitutes infringement is uh, limited by the territory of the, of the, of the patent. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do is give you uh, a, a recent case that was filed. I don't know, anybody here wear Adidas shoes? Anybody, anybody have? Any shoes with three stripes on them? Um, Adidas and Puma are like, you know, they're locked in a death struggle and have been for about 50 years. I don't know if you know this, but Adidas and Puma, they started out actually as like a partnership and then they split up. Uh, you know, this is in the 1800s and the two companies have been at each other's throats uh, ever since, I think, more than 40 lawsuits between the two of them. Um, and the most recent one uh, comes uh, over these two, sh these two shoes. Here's the Adidas three-stripe design, uh, and here's the Puma. Uh, I count four stripes, but um, this, is, this is the subject of the lawsuit. Um, Companies will use infringement actions uh, in order to achieve commercial monopolies. Big companies very frequently uh, file infringement actions, not because they feel they've been infringed, but in order to uh, expand the scope of their, of their um, uh, commercial monopolies. In, in many ways, patent uh, infringement actions are used as a commercial weapon not so much uh, to establish the boundaries of any particular intellectual property protection. It's a way of snuffing out your competition. And Adidas and Puma have been in the business of trying to snuff each other out for about 40 years. And each of them have been in the business of trying to snuff out every little guy that's ever got into the shoe business 
along with them. And so does Nike, and so does, to a lesser extent, New Balance. The, the shoe industry is a cutthroat industry. Um, and it's a perfect example of how infringement is used to create commercial monopolies. They even, um, they even um, uh, sued Tesla uh, for, um, if I can get to it, um, Tesla had a, now Tesla doesn't make shoes, um, but I thought I'd just show you this, because I found it kind of remarkable. Where are my shoes? Okay. Um, I lost it. <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, forget it. Anyhow, Tesla, Tesla filed a, um, a uh, patent application um, that involved uh, a design with three stripes. And even though Tesla makes automobiles, not shoes, uh, uh, Adidas filed a uh, patent infringement action against Tesla for filing a, a design with uh, a patent application with a design for three stripes. And Tesla withdrew rather than um, fight uh, Adidas. So it, it goes beyond just uh, you know the stripes on a shoe. Anytime you draw three lines any place, watch out because Adidas could be uh, right behind you. All right. Um, on Monday, uh, we're not meeting. I'm not meeting. Uh, but I'm Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. And on Monday, I promise the story uh, of graphene because I'm going to make this all apply to material science. And you'll see why we've been talking about all this. Um, but Monday is graphene. Yes, sir? You said patent protection is territorial. How does that, for a large multinational companies, they apply, multiple, they apply for multiple patents? All over the world. They, there are giant engulf and devour law firms out there that do nothing but take U.S. patents and then apply in other countries for them. Uh, a, a process which has become much easier recently because we're a first-to-file country. It used to be very complicated. But what they do now is they take a company like Adidas or Apple, they'll have a patent portfolio, and you literally will patent their bag in every country in the world. And that's why those guys drive around in Lamborghinis that say IP Law 1. And that's why I still don't have a Lamborghini. Uh, yeah, you have, you have a question? Oh, I thought you said you had a Lamborghini. Uh, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of Subaru. Is there liability for a patent owner if a design causes injury? Yes. Um, uh, oftentimes, um, uh, uh, design flaws, uh, you know, usually the patent holder is the one that is marketing and selling the device. If you're not manufacturing, if you're not involved in the manufacture, marketing or sale of the device, you're probably not uh, directly liable. That's one of the things that is contained in the fine print when you license your invention to Ford Motor Company. Okay? Unless the patent holder is the one that's designing, manufacturing, and marketing them. You know? Yeah. In which case, you have insurance. Is one of the things that you want to get when you when you patent a device is you get liability insurance, very very cheap actually. But these that's just one of the things you have to do when you're out there marketing something um, to the public, yeah. And that's why oftentimes you want to take your device and just license it, and you're done with it. Take the money and go invent something else. Let somebody else worry about everything. You know, okay. All set. Thank you. Yes.